Now, to, to begin this discussion, it's very important that we address something basic that I think we all often take for granted in, 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 in the English language, uh, which is what does it mean when a book or a speaker says something literally? Right? So if you were to say, to say to someone, someone comes up to you and says, hey, what's up with the Quran? How come the Quran says husbands should strike their wives? You say, oh, no, it doesn't really say that. It says, you know, you have to understand it in the context. And, and he says, no, but it says, it says strike them. It literally says that. You'll probably hear someone, they say, it literally says that. Be very, very, very wary of this word literally. Anytime somebody says literally, your brain, you know, red light should start going off in your brain. Like lawyers say, you know, whenever somebody says clearly, it's not clear what they're, what they're actually talking about. No one. There is actually no such thing as literal meaning. There is no such thing as literal meaning. Why is that? You could say, oh, wait, look, let's take a sentence. Uh, then strike them. We can look up the words them, then. We can look up the words strike. We can look up the word them in the dictionary. And that's a literal meaning. Except, as anyone who's ever tried to read Shakespeare knows, the meaning of words changes over time. So when Sherlock, we read Sherlock Holmes mysteries, if anyone ever reads Sherlock Holmes, he always says, Watson, I'm going to do my toilet now. You're like, oh, why are you talking about this? You know, just excuse yourself. Because back then, toilet meant you're going to go and shave and, and brush your hair. It doesn't, and then it's like, uh, you know, people are always looking for, for cleaner, more polite ways to talk about what they're really doing. So eventually, toilet came to mean what we understand it. And now we, we say, I'm going to the bathroom. And probably 50, 60 years from now, going to the bathroom will be really gross. So we'll say something like, I'm going to go to some room. I don't know. Who knows what we'll say. The point is, the meaning of words changes over time. Second of all, context is always part of how we understand something we read or say or hear said. And what, when we talk about literal meaning, what we're really talking about is something else. It's called, scholars of language and communication call it evident meaning. Evident meaning. And by the way, here Muslim scholars were about, you know, 1,200 years ahead, and they said, there's, it's called zahir, zahir nas, the evident meaning of the text, the, te the meaning that comes to you quickest, most immediately, the meaning that you arrive at with the least number of steps in your mind. That's the evident meaning. Now, the evident meaning is oftentimes very different from the dictionary meaning, you know, where you go and look up words. For example, if somebody says, you know, I... I'm sorry to use this example a lot, but it's a good one. If, somebody's, if you're walking in a dark alley at night and someone comes out with a gun and says, give me your money, give me all your money. You know, literally, oh, dictionary-wise, all my money would be all my liquid assets, and I'd have to go to the ATM machine, get my money in the bank account, I'd have to go and liquidate my 401k or whatever like that. That's not what the person means. They mean, give me what's in your wallet, and they mean probably give me your watch and stuff like that as well. We don't, you don't sit there and go through a calculation in your mind. You know immediately what they mean. That's the evident meaning. It's actually very different from the dictionary meaning. The evident meaning is determined by your culture, by context, by tone. And I love, you know, I love movies like the Naked, anyone see the Naked Gun movies or you know, airplane. These movies are so funny because they're oftentimes the jokes are about people who don't understand, who are outside, who are making fun of the, they're outside the culture that understands evident meaning. So when somebody says, uh, you know, there's news from the hospital. The person says, hospital, what's that? The other person says, oh, it's a building and has patients in it and there's doctors and nurses. You know, he means like, what's the news from the hospital? But the joke is, the other person's literally saying, what's the hospital? So it's this idea of the per, you know one of the people is kind of clueless about the evident meaning. This gives endless uh, possibility for jokes. Why am I getting into all this? Because when somebody comes up to you and says the Quran literally says something, you immediately have to ask yourself, how is it that we should understand the Quran? How is the Quran understood? Is the Quran understood based on evident meaning? Or is the Quran always engaged at, more, at deeper levels, at more profound levels, at more 
uh, derivative levels. And that's the case. The Quran is always engaged at a deeper level. And this is a function of the very nature of the Quran as a text. The Quran is a text that is revealed in time. It's revealed in, it's totally wrapped up in the events of the Prophet's life, alayhi salam. It's completely wrapped up in the questions that are at, posed to him, in the challenges that the Muslim community faces, in the, the, their defeats, their victories, their fears, their hopes. Some verses of the Quran are universal. Qad afil hal mu'minun. The believers are felicitous. This, those verses, they just they, they soar above time. They soar above circumstance. But there's other verses that are wrapped up in the life of the Prophet. You know, when uh, the Tabbat Yada Abi Lahab and Watab, who's, uh, who's Abi Lahab? Who's Abu Lahab? What is it talking? Why is why are his hands perished? What is this talking about? This you have to know the context. Uh, when when uh, when people in the West think of Scripture, they think of the Bible, and the Bible is a text that is, uh, it is a very well, it's a cornerstone of the Western literary canon. It is one of the two or three big cornerstones. It defines the way we think in the United States and the West, the way we think about what a text, or what a book should be. It has a beginning, it has an end. Each book has is chronological. You can follow it. There's a plot. You can, you, you can, uh, you know, there's not parts that are mixed up in time. There's not parts that aren't set very clearly against their background in the life of you know, Moses or Joshua or, or Jesus. That's not the nature of the, the Quranic text. The Quran is a, the Quranic text is this segment of divine consciousness. It's like a stream of consciousness that is caught up in the, the temporal world, caught up in the world of man. And that's always how Muslims understood it. There is no Muslim sect, no Muslim school of thought not Sunni, not Shia, not even Ismaili that reads the Quran alone. All Muslim sects, no matter how far out you go on the spectrum, they always read the Quran through, does anybody know what they read it through? They through read it through a lens. Does anyone know what that lens is? The Sunnah of the Prophet. They read it through the Sunnah of the Prophet. And now, sometimes you'll hear about, you know, Quran-only movements or Quran-only groups. The, my, my biggest objection to Quran-only groups is that you cannot read the Quran alone. It's impossible. There are words in the Quran, phrases in the Quran, that don't exist anywhere else. They, don't, they only appear once in the Quran, like the, the discussion of dhihar, those, alladhina yudhahiruna azwajuhum. There's no other way to understand what this means, except from the traditions of the Prophet ﷺ and his companions that explain this is a man who says to his wife, you're like the back of my mother to me. There's no other way to understand this. You have to rely on the sunnah of the Prophet. And it is the sunnah of the Prophet and the way of the early Muslim community and the tradition of the scholars who built on their understanding of the Qur'an, it is that lens through which we read the Qur'an and it is that lens that takes us away from the evident meaning to the intended meaning of the text. This is very important. When the Qur'an says, إِنَّمَا الْمُشْرِكُونَ najas," The Qur'an says, indeed, polytheists are najas. We all know what najas means, right? You're probably all Hanafis, I'm guessing. So you very have a good understanding of what Nejis means. If you, if you go and you shake hands with Mr. Nejis, and Mr. Nejis has just come in from his jog, and he's nice and sweaty, and he's, ah, nice to meet you. And you shake, what are you going to have to do now? You have to go wash your hands. You can't pray. Okay? If you sit there and Mr. Nejis is eating food with you, you know, putting finger in his mouth, and he's taking more food, and he reaches over to your food, and things like that. Now what, can, now what do you do? Can you marry Mrs. Nejis? No. Does anybody, what, does anyone remember from the life of the Prophet, does anyone remember instances where he shakes, you know, Abu Talib's hand? He's like, oh. 
Got to go wash. Oh, that's, see, that would, I would just made my shirt in a jasa. I have to go. Can't touch anything. I have to go wash my hands. Does anyone remember instance in the life of the prophet where that happens? Does anyone know instance where he doesn't want to eat food with mushrikun or doesn't want to let them into his mosque to talk to him? So how do we know that this verse cannot, sorry, cannot be literal? It cannot be the evident meaning. We know it because the sunnah of the Prophet shows us it has to be another meaning. And this is what Muslim scholars, with the exception of a very few in the early period, this is what they all understood this verse as meaning. It's not the bodies of the mushrikeen that are najas. It's their beliefs. Their their beliefs are are filthy, not their bodies. We know this because the Prophet never acted in a way that their bodies were filthy. And that's uh, the, the principle that Muslim scholars came up with. It's called at-tahara al-adamiyya, that all the human body, us in its default state, is pure. It's important to remember this. It is very important to remember this when you think about the Quran and when people ask you about the Quran. Because if you're a a regular, let's say, English speaker, American person, for you, a far-fetched meaning, a meaning that's really pushing it, an explanation that's really pushing it, is one that is distant from the evident meaning of a statement or a a piece of writing. So if you say to somebody, uh, it's actually, there's actually an interesting case in a legal case where uh, a, a po- police officer st- interrupts a robbery, and one of the guys, robbers, has a gun. And the police officer says, give me the gun. And one of the robbers says to the other one, let him have it. He says, so what does he mean? Does he mean let him have the gun, or does he mean let him have it, right? Shoot him. This is very... Uh, this is it's kind of a this is a good example. This is not pushing it. If the, the the robber says, "No, no, I meant let him have the gun." But if I meant, you know, if the robber said, uh, "Let me try and think of something," you know, "Give it to him, good." If the robber said, "Give it to him, buddy," and then he went in court and he said, "No, I didn't mean shoot him five times. I meant, you know, give it to him, good. You know, you know, give it to him. Yes, good. Give him the gun." Then everyone in the jury is going to say, oh, yeah, right. No, 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 no. That's pushing it. That's too far. That's how we interact with each other in language. But when you have a text like the Quran that is always read through the sunnah of the prophet, you have to look at what the sunnah of the prophet is telling you to understand the intended meaning of the text. And in that case, the intended meaning of God's words is not necessarily the one that's closest to the evident meaning. It is the one that is best supported by the evidence of the other verses of the Quran, of the sunnah of the prophet, of our our understanding of the overall teachings of Islam. This is what tells us the intended meaning of of the Quran. 